Good morning, my friends. Happy Tuesday, uh, day 25 in the Chronological Bible. Um, okay, so we're almost caught up. Woo, I can't walk this morning. This might be interesting. We're almost caught up in the Bible to the actual date. See, I'll show you. Hi, Karen. See how it, let's see. Can I do this one more? Can see how it has a date? It's like, it's actually dated instead of saying day one, day two. So we're almost caught up. I don't know if I'm going to get two in today, but because uh, I'm going to do a cooking video after this. So we'll see. All right. So let's jump right in. The account in Exodus is traditionally thought to have begun approximately 300 years after Joseph's death. Two dates are listed throughout the traditional earlier date and an alternative later date. So it's somewhere around, they believe, 1526 or 1360 B.C. So the Israelites in Egypt, Exodus 1 through 22. These are the names of the sons of Israel, that is, Jacob, who moved to Egypt with their father, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. In all, Jacob had 70 descendants in Egypt, including Joseph, who was already there. In, in time, Joseph and all of his brothers died, ending that entire generation. But their descendants, the Israelites, had many children and grandchildren. In fact, they multiplied so greatly that they became extremely powerful and filled the land. Eventually, a new king came into power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. He said to his people, Look, the people of Israel now outnumber us and are stronger than we. We must make a plan to keep them from growing even more. If we don't, and if war breaks out, they will join our enemies and fight against us. Then they will escape from the country. So the Egyptians made the Israelites their slaves. They appointed brutal slave drivers over them, hoping to wear them down with crushing labor. They forced them to build cities forced them to build the cities of Pithom and Ramses as supply centers for the king. But the more Egyptians oppressed them, the more the Israelites multiplied and spread, the more, and the more the alarmed the Egyptians became. So the Egyptians worked with the people of Israel without mercy. They made their lives bitter, forcing them to mix mortar and bricks and do all the work in the fields. They were ruthless in all of their demands. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives. Sifra and, and Pua. Get back down there. When you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous, and they have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives, and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all of his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. The birth of Moses, Exodus 2, 1 through 10. About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was, special, he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister then stood in, at a distance, watching to see what would happen. Soon, Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe in the river, and her attendants walked along the riverbank. When the princess saw the basket among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it for her. When the princess opened it, she saw the baby. A little boy was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then the baby's sister approached the princess. Should I go find one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you, she asked. Yes, do, the princess replied. So the girl went and called the baby's mother. Take this baby and nurse him for me, the princess told the baby's mother mother I will pay you for your help so the woman took her baby back home and nursed him later when the boy was older his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her own son imagine how hard that must have been the princess named him Moses for she explained I lifted him out of the water it's just such a quick story about how this mom gave her baby to this Pharaoh's daughter and I just can't imagine how gut-wrenching that was for Moses' mom. I just, ugh. Okay, Moses escaped to Midian. Exodus 2, 1 th 2, 11 through 25. 
Moses was 40 years old when what follows took place. Many years later, when Moses had grown up, he was out to visit his own people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating of one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to one who started the fight. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters who came as usual to draw water and fill troughs for their father's flock. But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. When the girls returned to Raoul, their father, he asked, Why are you back so soon today? An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, they answered. And then he drew water for us and watered our flocks. Then where is he, their father asked. Why did you leave him there? Invite him to come and eat with us. Moses accepted the invitation and he settled there, <coughs> and he settled there with him. In time, Raoul gave Moses his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Later, she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom. For he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. Years passed, and the king of Egypt died. But the Israelites continued to groan under the burden of slavery. They cried out for help, and their cry rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. Okay, Moses' family tree. This is from 1 Chronicles 6, 1 through 3a. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The descendants of Kohath were Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. The children of Amram were Aaron, Moses, and Miriam. Moses and the burning bush, Exodus 3, 1 through 22, which was around 1446 or 1280 BC. Uh, At this time, Moses was 80 years old. One day Moses was tending his flock, his father-in-law, with his father in law let's start over. One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush. Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of the harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and precious land. It is flowing. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people of Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested, If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask me, What's his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. I just got goosies. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Now go and call together the all the elders of Israel. Tell them, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me, he told them. 
I have been watching closely, and I see how the Egyptians are treating you. I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt. I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. The elders of Israel will accept your message. Then you and the elders must go to the king of Egypt and tell them, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. So please let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand forces him. So I will raise my hand and strike the Egyptians, performing all kinds of miracles among them. Then at last he will let you go. And I will cause the Egyptians to look favorably on you. They will give you gifts when you go, so you will not leave empty-handed. Every Israelite woman will ask for articles of silver and gold and fine clothing from her Egyptian neighbors and from the foreign women in their houses. You will dress your sons and daughters with these, stripping the Egyptians of their wealth. Signs of the Lord's power, Exodus 4, 1 through 17. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say the Lord has never appeared to you? Then the Lord asked him, what is that in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw it down, down the staff and it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Then the Lord told him, reach out and grab its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it and it turned back into a shepherd's staff in his hand. Perform this sign, the Lord told him. They will believe that the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, really has appeared to you. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand inside his cloak, and when he took it out again, his hand was as white as snow with severe skin disease. Now put your hand back into your cloak, the Lord said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out again, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. The Lord said to Moses, If they do not believe you and you are not convinced and are not convinced by the first miraculous sign, then they will be convinced by the second sign. And if they don't believe you or listen to you, even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it onto the dry ground. When you do, the water from the Nile River will turn to blood on the ground. But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I am not very good with words. I never have been. And I'm not now, even though I have... I'm not very good with words. Where did I lost my place. Blah. Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I have never been. I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue tied with my words and they get and my words get tangled. <laughs> then the Lord asked Moses, Who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? It is not is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. But Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Then the Lord became angry with Moses. All right, he said, what about your brother Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he is on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put <clears throat> and put the words in his mouth. I will be with you as both of, I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct both of you in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman to the people. He will be your mouthpiece, and you will stand in the place of God for him. Tell him, telling him what to say, and take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to pour, perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. All right, let's see how much. Oh, let's just do it. February 2nd. We're going to be on track. I'm kind of excited about that. Okay. Moses returns to Egypt, Exodus 4, 18 through 31. So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt, Moses said. I don't even know if they are still alive. Go in peace, Jethro replied. Before Moses left Midian, the Lord said to him, Return to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you have died. So Moses took his wife and his sons, put them on a donkey, and headed back to the land of Egypt. In his hand he carried the staff of God. And the Lord told Moses, When you arrive back in Egypt, go to Pharaoh and perform all the miracles I have empowered you to do. But I will harden his heart so he will refuse to let the people go. Then you will tell him, This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. I commanded you. Let my son go so he can worship me. But since you have refused, I will now kill your firstborn son. 
on the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, Now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. When she said bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. Now the Lord said to Aaron, Go out into the wilderness to meet Moses. So Aaron went and Moses... Aaron went and met Moses at the mountain of God, and he embraced him. Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had commanded him to say. And he told Moses the miraculous signs. <clears throat> nope. And he told him, I like to put words where they're not even there, apparently. And he told him the miraculous signs the Lord had commanded him to perform. Then Moses and Aaron returned to Egypt and called the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything the Lord had told Moses, and Moses performed the miraculous signs as they watched. Then the people of Israel were convinced that the Lord God had sent Moses and Aaron. When they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Moses and Aaron speak to Pharaoh, Exodus 5, 1 through 5. After this presentation to the Israel's leaders, Moses and Aaron went to spoke went to Moses and Aaron went and spoke to Pharaoh. They told him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Is that so? retorted Pharaoh. And who is this Lord? Why should I listen to him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. But Aaron and Moses persisted. The God of the Hebrews has met with us, they declared. So let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness so we can offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If we don't, he will kill us with a plague of the, kill us with a plague, or with the sword. Pharaoh replied, Moses and Aaron, why are you distracting the people from their tasks? Get back to work. Look, there are many of your people in the land and you are stopping them from their work. Making bricks without straw, Exodus 5, 6 through 23. That same day, Pharaoh sent this order to the Egyptian slave drivers and the Israelite foremen. Do not supply any more straw for making bricks. Make the people get it themselves, but still require them to make a number, the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce quota. They are lazy. That's why they are crying out, let us go and offer our sacrifices to our God. Load them down with more work. Make them sweat. That will teach them <clears throat> to listen to lies. So, so the slave driver and the foreman went out and told the people, this is what Pharaoh says. I will not provide any more straw for you. Go and get it yourselves. Find it where you can, but you must produce just as many bricks as before. So the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt in search of stubble to use as straw. Meanwhile, the Egyptian slave drivers continued to push hard. Meet your daily quota of bricks just as you did when we provided you with straw, they demanded. Then they whipped the Israelite for foreman they had put in charge of the work crews. Crews, Why haven't you met your quota either yesterday or today, they demanded. So the Israelite foreman went to Pharaoh and pleaded with him. Please don't treat your servants like this, they begged. We are given no straw, but the slave drivers still demand us to make bricks. We are being beaten, but it is not our fault. Your own people are to blame. But Pharaoh shouted, you're just lazy, lazy. That's why you're saying, let us go and offer sacrifices to the Lord. Now get back to work. No straw will be given to you, but you must still produce the full quota of bricks. I have the hiccups. The Israelite foreman could see that they were in serious trouble when they were told you must not reduce the number of bricks you make each day. As they left Pharaoh's court, they confronted Moses and Aaron who were waiting outside for them. The foreman said to them, may the Lord judge punish you for making us stink before Pharaoh and his officials. You have put a sword in their hands, an excuse, an excuse to kill us. Then Moses went back to the Lord and protested, Why have you brought all of this trouble on your own people, Lord? Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, he has been even more brutal to your people, and you have done nothing to rescue them. A promise of deliverance. Exodus 6, 1 through 13. Then the Lord told Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. When he feels the force of my strong hand, he will let the people go. In fact, he will force them to leave his land. And God said to Moses, I am Yahweh, the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shaddai, God Almighty. But I did not reveal my name Yahweh to them. And I reaffirmed my covenant with them. Under its terms, I promised to give them the land of Canaan, where they were living as foreigners. You can be sure that I heard the groans of the people of Israel 
who are now slaves to the Egyptians, and I am well aware of my covenant with them. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord. I will free you from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the oppression in Egypt. I will bring you into the land I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as your very own possession. I am the Lord. So Moses told the people of Israel what the Lord had said, and they refused to listen anymore. They had become too discouraged by the brutality of their slavery. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his country. But Lord, Moses objected, my own people won't listen to me anymore. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen? I'm such a clumsy speaker. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them orders for the Israelites and for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. The Ancestors of Moses and Aaron, Exodus 6, 14 through 30. These are the ancestors of some of the clans of Israel. The sons of Reuben, Israel's oldest son, were Hanak, Pelu, Hezron, and Carmi. The descendants became the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon were Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shal. Shal's mother was a Canaanite woman. Their descendants became the clans of Simeon. These were the descendants of Levi, as listed in their family record. The sons of Levi were Gershon, Kohath, Merari. Levi lived to be 137 years old. The descendants of Gershon included Libni and Shimei, 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 uh, each of those, uh, each of whom were the descendants of the clan, <coughs> of a clan. The descendants of Kohath included Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel. Kohath lived to be 133 years old. The descendants of Merari included Mali and Mushi. <laughs> those are good names. Uh, these are the clans of the Levites as listed in their family records. Amram married his father's sister, Jochebed, and she gave birth to his sons, Aaron and Moses. Amram lived to be 137 years old. The sons of Izhar were Korah, Napheg, and Ziri. The sons of Uziel were Mishael, El Elzapham, and Sithri. Aaron married Elisheba, the daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Nashon, and gave birth to his sons, Nabad, nope, Nadad, Ibahu, El Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah were Aser, Elkanah, and Abiaseth. Their descendants became the clans of Korah. Eleazar, the son of Aaron, married one of the daughters of Putiel and gave birth to his son, fin Phinehas. These are the ancestors of the Levite families listed according to their clans. The Aaron and Moses named in this list are the same ones whom the Lord said, lead the people out of Israel and out of the land of Egypt like an army. It was Moses and Aaron who spoke to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. When the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, he said to him, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, everything I am telling you. But Moses argued with the Lord saying, I can't do it. I'm such a clumsy speaker. Why should Pharaoh listen to me? Aaron's staff becomes a snake, Exodus 7, 1 through 13. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, pay close attention to this. I will make you seem like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. Tell Aaron everything I have commanded you. And Aaron must command, the Pharaoh, command Pharaoh to let the people of Israel leave his country. But I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn so I can multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Even when Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you, even then, Pharaoh will refuse to listen to you. So I will bring down my first, my fist. Wow, maybe I shouldn't have done two today. <laughs> so I will bring down my fist on Egypt. Then I will rescue my forces, my people, the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. When I raise my powerful hand and bring out the Israelites, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they made their demands to Pharaoh. When the, then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Aaron, Pharaoh, <laughs> Pharaoh will demand, show me a miracle. And when he does this, say to Aaron, 
Take your staff and throw it down in front of Pharaoh, and it will become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did what the Lord had commanded them. Aaron threw down his staff before Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh called in his own wise men and sorcerers, and these Egyptian magicians did the same thing with their magic. They threw down their staffs, which also became serpents. But then Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard. He still refused to listen, just as the Lord had predicted. All right. That's it for day 25. Tomorrow we go on to the plague, starting with the plague of blood. And we're on track. So tomorrow... The book says here February 3rd. So we're on, we're, we've, we're caught up. Our nine days that we missed at the beginning of the year are all caught up. So yay, I'm excited about that. All right, that's it for today. That was 26 minutes, that's good. Forgot to wear my watch to get my steps. Oh well, <laughs> got them anyway. All right, have a beautiful Tuesday. It's snowing, we're gonna get a foot of snow here. So it's gonna be lovely here today. So just pray we don't lose power. <laughs> Oh, okay, I will talk to you all later. I'm going to go upstairs and do some co a cooking video. So I love you all. I will talk to you soon. Bye.